Hi, good afternoon to everybody who's starting to join us. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. We have a lot of information to cover. Woohoo! It's going to be fun, fun, fun. So I'm just seeing everybody that's starting to pop in. And just to let you guys know that I could see you as you're joining, as you're getting in here, I can see everybody's name as you're hopping in. I cannot see your faces, but I absolutely can see your names as you're joining the um, webinar. Um, your cameras are automatically off and everybody is muted by default. So, but we do have a lot of information to cover this afternoon. Um, uh, this course just is, Hi, so great to be back with you again this week. I know it's so great to have you back, Lisa. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know if it shows or not while we're doing these, and I hope it does, but Pete and I actually enjoy presenting these courses just as much as the agents enjoy taking the courses with us. So we really do have a good time with you guys. It totally does. Thank you. I 2 p.m. I'll have to change to my cell. Will that work? Make sure that you're connected with your cell before you disconnect with your uh, computer that you're using right now. So when you switch devices, sometimes you, you run into some problems and I would say leave your browser open um, because the states absolutely look at the time that you're in the session. Yeah, the state, when, as soon as everybody's uh, issued a unique identifier that's uh, uh, written into your registration. So when you log in, there's a timestamp for your time in session. And then at the end, when you leave, there is a leave time. Our system's integrated with Zoom and that report is automatically pulled over and those timestamps are submitted with, with the credit submissions so that the state sees that you're on your devices for the uh, amount of time required. Yvette, I see that you have your hand hand raised. Um, you could unmute yourself, I've unmuted you so that you could speak. Hi, how are you? Just a quick question. Um, I'm almost to my laptop. Um, do we need to be like logged in like within five minutes after you start? Because I would prefer to switch from my cell phone to my laptop, is that possible? Yes, no? yes, you could switch over, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. just Sorry. just don't hang up your phone until you get in on your laptop. Until I get in. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Thank you. You're very welcome. So, um, yes, yeah, so this course is really a great course, really a great course. It's so funny because a lot of people think, oh, 1978, it's it's done. It's no worries, but you would be you're going to be floored when you see how lead is still an issue today um, in 2021. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, and, and, and because of that, that's why the city of Philadelphia started with that lead safe law in October, just this past October in 2020. Uh, just because if there's, Pete will show you that we have this map and it has the different zip codes within the city of Philadelphia and the amount of children that right now have lead levels that exceed the, the guidelines is, is heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. First time I saw this, I, I filled up. So it just, it just tugged at my heartstrings. So it's really still an issue. Um, let me see what time is it? Okay, good. You know what? I'm just going to get started so that we can get started. Like I said, we do have a lot of information. Oh, hi, Elmer. Will you do another read on class? Another one scheduled for Wednesday. I can't make Wednesday. Ah, uh, yes. Let me see. Do I have it on the schedule yet? I do not. So I'm going to assume that I'm going to have that the week of May 18th or the week of May 20th. Um, the week, what would that be? What's that Monday? The week of May 17th or the week of May 24th. Anyway, so who are we and why do we do these things? We're Pete and Patty. We're from Real Estate Inspections. Real Estate Inspections is the largest privately owned 
film inspection firm in the region. And we have the largest territory. We serve all of Eastern Pennsylvania, Central and Southern New Jersey, Northeastern Maryland, and most of Delaware as well. Not only are we the largest, we're also the highest rated. And we're so proud of our over 2,000 five-star reviews on all forms of social media. We're on Google, Yelp, and these Angie's List, Home Advisor, Facebook. If you haven't had a chance to check out our Facebook page, hop on there, give us a like, uh, look at some of the posts from previous classes. I may have been talking about you and bragging about how wonderful you are. <laughs> um, that's driven by our exceptional customer service, the amazing support team that's behind the scenes to ensure that your inspector just focuses on you and your client. And then of course, our fabulous inspectors. And it's also driven by the fact that we're one-stop shop and we do commercial, residential, rate on termite. We do the EPA-led safe inspections. All of our inspectors are EPA-led certified inspectors. We also do, um, we do pre-listing inspections, which is really a good idea right now with this crazy market. We also do new construction progress inspections. We say progress because we come in at different phases. We come in for um, the foundation, then we come in for the pre-drywall after the roughings have been uh, in place uh, before, the, before the insulation and the drywall goes in, we, we come in and take a look at everything. And then of course the final walkthrough. We also do sewer line video inspections. And I'll get back to that in a second. We do stucco inspections. We perform more stucco inspections than anybody. Pete has performed tens of thousands of inspections throughout his career up and down the coast. Um, and has developed with that experience, he's been able to develop a very unique two-step process where we do a level one, which is non-invasive. We'll do a visual inspection when we rely on some technologies such as interior thermal imaging and moisture scanning as well. Thermal imaging, another fabulous tool. It's not, not x-ray vision, but the anomalies that appear then they show us some temperature differentials and it really gives us a lot of information. We do air quality testing for a biological substance consistent with mold. Everybody knows that's my favorite phrase. It's, it's not just a tape lift or a swab that says, yeah, the green fuzzy stuff is mold. It, it gives you actionable information. And then, like I said, I was gonna get back to it, our sewer line video inspections. So sewer lateral video inspections, a lot of people in Pennsylvania know, there's a lot of townships and municipalities that now require that inspection service as part of the real estate transaction. So in some of those municipalities, yes, we can perform that for you while doing the home inspection. And because and because more and more of these um, townships and boroughs are, are starting to require this, they're hopping on this bandwagon, we decided to make your life a little bit easier. We threw together some bundles, uh, a couple packages that are nice and what is the cost for the sewer lit, uh, video inspection? Um, that's three forty nine, dollars with, uh, with a home inspection. So it's quite reasonable. You've got a text message. Um, and <laughs> um, anyway, so we've created these packages with agents in mind. We know that you guys like to call and schedule the inspections for your client. Um, so to make that call quicker and easier, we put together some packages. We have our essentials, which is your typical home radon termite. And then we have an intrusion detection package. That package includes that sewer lateral video inspection. It also includes a combustible gas leak detection inspection, as well as interior thermal imaging. Again, a great tool. And then just to take it one step further, we have a maximum awareness package that includes everything in the intrusion detection package, but it also includes that air quality testing for a mole concentration. Um, and we and, and like I said, the pack, building the packages was more for agents in mind than for clients. And, and, and of course we have our courses and we make ourselves available. We do all these things because we appreciate you. Everything that we do, we do with you in mind. And that's just because we see the job that you do, the, the devotion that you have to your clients, the amazing uh, amount of hours that you put in on your cell phones and text messages and emails, day, night, evenings, weekends. Um, the, oh, I thought maybe we, were, we weren't gonna tell them about the prizes. It'll be a surprise. <laughs> 
Now, if your client calls and schedules an inspection and mentions that we happen to be on your list of providers, then once a week, I put your name in a hat and we do this really fun drawing. And I call you and say, surprise. And you get to choose from any of these really cool devices. I'm an old lady, I'm not techie, but I love every single one of these devices. And they're, and they're again, all to make your life a lot easier um, and fun. And they're a lot of fun too. They're so much fun. At the end of the year, just for kicks and giggles, we take all the names that I've gathered through the whole year, put them in one big hat and have a grand prize drawing for... Sorry about that. <laughs> Excel sheet. You don't have enough work to do. We're going to send you some new stuff. <laughs> We're going to send you a 75 inch HD smart TV. Um, and this is really a lot of fun. I keep mentioning Pete. Who's Pete? Pete's the owner of our firm. He's one of our founding fathers. He's our chief inspector. He's the guy that not only loves educating you, he loves educating everybody on the team. He makes sure that the support staff is up to date on, on all the latest trends. He's also out there constantly with the inspectors, meeting with the inspectors, shadowing the inspectors, working side by side with them to, again, make sure that they're up to date on everything, have the latest technology, have the best tools and equipment possible. He makes sure that every inspector inspects the same way he does, analyzes as Pete does, and reports as Pete does. Everybody takes a course and says, oh, I need an inspection. I want Pete. Trust me, you don't get Pete. You get repeat. You get a mini Pete. I'm sure you, I apologize. I sure you all hear my phone going off right now. And I just have to share with you. It's very exciting because in your line of business, you're going to understand how exciting this is. My daughter has put on, put about 12 bids in on 12 different houses within the past three weeks, has been outbidded on every single one. And she just got word that she, her offer was accepted. <laughs> she, she has a house. So, and I'm sure everybody on here can relate to the joy that's going on within our family at this moment. It's so funny because she texted me this morning and said, I hate this house. <laughs> But it's a beautiful home, beautiful home. I know, I know, yay. I know, I'm very excited. So I apologize for my phone going off, but it's, I'm sure you could all understand how exciting this is. Um, anyway, without further ado, um, now that I've given you this big build up on how fabulous Pete is, I'm gonna step aside, text my daughter and say congratulations and let Pete get started to um, get into the course. Have a wonderful time, enjoy, ask a ton of questions. You have a leader in the industry sitting in front of you for the next two hours. So pick his brain, ask a million questions and have a really good time. I'll pop back on at the end to give you some information on some upcoming courses and how to expect to receive your credits. And have a good time. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I uh, apologize. I was bouncing around there because I wanted to follow up. Uh, Maria had asked the cost of the sewer line video inspections, and Patty had indicated they're 349 Just wanted to clarify, that is with a home inspection. So if you order a home inspection and also add in a sewer line video inspection, uh, you know, like if you were to get the essentials and add it, it would be 349 here. Uh, but if you got it in the intrusion detection package, the price with that has been significantly reduced. That's the whole purpose of these packages is to significantly reduce these add-on prices. So uh, if you order the intrusion detection package, you're getting $50 off of the sewer line video inspection just by point of interest. So today we're going to be talking about lead safety. And Patty uh, was you know, kind of giving some indications that... Um, uh, things are a little bit, uh, as they're, you know, things are happening here in the industry, a little bit different than what we thought we would be, you know, where we would be at this point in time, uh, now that we are in the future and <laughs> looking forward. Uh, so we'll talk about that. We'll unpack that. But uh, before we do, I want to talk about the fact that this is a Zoom webinar. So just in case you guys, you're probably very familiar by now with Zoom meetings, like everybody in the world seems to be. Um, did, what wasn't the case, you know, a year ago, you know, just a little over that, right? So uh, now everybody's up to speed on what Zoom meetings are, but Zoom webinars are a little bit different because Zoom webinars really, the Zoom, the Zoom designed them so that we'd be focused on the content on the screen uh, for educational purposes. So not going to see your picture up there, your photo, your video feed, 
That doesn't mean that we don't want to interact with you guys. We absolutely do. You just want to make sure that if you uh, have a question, you have a comment, yeah, you want to tell a story or anything at all, please don't hesitate to interact with us. Type your question into the chat box as you guys have already been doing or into the Q&A box. I have visibility to the both of them. So please don't hesitate to ask questions. If you do, I'm gonna to, going to just right in the flow of the class, I'm gonna engage you and answer your question and we'll talk about it. Uh, if you have a question, let's say that you have a question that requires a little bit of unpacking, a little bit of development, and you say, look, I don't wanna type all this in or I just don't feel like typing in, go ahead and raise your hand, hit that raise hand button. If you raise your hand, I'm going to assume you want me to enable you to talk. I'm happy to do that. You just want to make sure that if I say, uh, you know, that I've been able, able you to speak, that you make sure you're unmuted before you start talking. Because if you're muted, we're not going to be able to hear you. And that's going to be a little bit awkward. So, but guys, please, if you have questions, please, please, please don't hesitate to ask questions, make comments, tell us, you know, what your experiences have been. We love it when you guys are interactive. We really do feel like you're getting the most out of it. And that's what this is all about. So, what are we gonna to review today? What will you learn today? Well, we're gonna learn the importance of lead safety and we're gonna talk about the different ways in which when it comes to structures that we uh, uh, habitate, you know, habitate in or have, let's see, what's the word I'm looking for? In which we habitate <laughs> um, that, you know, we're gonna find that there's basically two different types. That's the next thing we're gonna look at that uh, are a concern to us. doesn't mean they're the only ones, but, we're going to talk about those and primarily today we're going to be focusing on the, the lead, the hazards of lead dust from lead based paint. So you're also going to learn what you should be concerned about or what you actually your buyers should be concerned about with lead safety. You know, as an inspector, you know, for the years and years, uh, we would have people that would, you know, uh, ask us, hey, do you do, do you do any kind of testing for lead based paint? Uh, or can you test for lead in the water supply? And yeah, absolutely, we can do both. Uh, but what I observed, uh, I guess, as a casual observer, was that primarily the people who were, you know, focused or focused on this issue were people that had young kids. We're going to talk about that too. Who's at greater risk of being exposed to uh, lead contamination? So we're going to talk about why your buyer should be concerned with that. What you're not going to learn today is you're not going to be an expert on lead safety, and you're not going to be able to provide legal advice or training on any uh, lead safety issues but you are gonna get a really good in-depth of picture of where we are today, what's going on with lead, particularly with, with lead contaminated dust in the home. And I'm gonna unpack that for you a little bit later. Um, and you know, what are the, the issues that we have to deal with and also what kind of governmental um, you know, regulation is involved? What's the government doing about this? What, what kind of laws are in place that we need to follow, particularly with regards to a real estate transaction? That's what we're gonna be taking a look at today. So talked about it, you know, there are two primary sources for lead in structures that we are concerned with in a home and they are lead-based paint, which is referring to this picture. And you're gonna talk about that in just a second and lead in the water supply, which clearly is what we're talking about here. Today, we're gonna to be focused on lead-based paint and the EPA's protocol for dealing with this issue. Uh, but first, before we do that, let me talk a little bit about uh, lead in the water supply. We're not trying to, by focusing on lead-based paint and issues surrounding that, we're not trying to diminish any issues that might be present with regards to lead in the water supply. Um, the, the reason we're focusing on lead-based paint issues is because the proliferation of that is far more vast than is lead in the water supply. Yes, there is some issues as you become aware in the past few years, for, say for instance, in Flint, Michigan, there's a significant issue with lead in the water supply, primarily because uh, as just as you can see in this picture, if you look at these two water supply pipes here, um, these two pipes I'm gonna paint yellow for you here, those are lead water pipes. And in particular, this one here, this is coming from the street. And so here you've got a lead water supply pipe out in the street. And then you've got a lateral that comes into the house that goes into uh, the main shutoff valve and at the meter location, you've got lead there. So the pipes themselves are lead. And so where, where you have that, that is a concern for higher concentrations of lead in the water supply. Do we have that around here? We do, it's not, there's not a lot of it. It's pretty rare for me to find uh, doing an inspection, for instance, uh, you know, a, a water, you know, lead water supply pipe 
uh, in, a, in a home. I, we do come across them. Now, I'd say maybe one out of a thousand homes that, uh, that I inspect, you know, has a lead water supply pipe. Um, they're typical, you know, when you scratch them, you'll see that they're the bright, shiny silver looking back at you. Uh, another way to tell this is lead is just simply by looking at it. If you can kind of take a look right here, you'll see that there's like this little bulbous, you know, where it's, it's bulged out. That's, that's pretty common for lead water supply pipes where they make the connections. Um, so we do have that. And so it's something to be taken serious. Most homes, if we tested, uh, even homes on public water supply, uh, any homes built prior to say the mid 1980s, will test for trace amounts, at least trace amounts of lead in the water supply. And that's primarily not, not because of the, there's lead water supply pipes, but actually the solder that we use to connect the copper pipes in the house, that solder had lead contained in it. So, um, you know, what we recommend is that if you live in a house that was built prior to the mid eighties, as, as I do, I get up in the morning and I go out to put, you know, uh, turn my water on for my coffee or whatever, I'll let that run for a little bit to get that water out of the pipes um, and let it let it flush out. So I'm not drinking or I'm not going to be ingesting the water that had been sitting in the pipes overnight. Because what happens is that water sits in the pipes overnight and you can get a higher concentration of lead coming out of the solder joint. So we, we just run the water for a couple minutes and that takes care of the problem. Uh, the, 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 the trace amounts of lead that will be in the water supply at that point are very, very minuscule. Um, so that's kind of where we are with the lead in the water supply. Yes, we do occasionally run into this, but not very often. Um, you know, and yes, there is the potential for lead in the water supply uh, if you have an older home, but most of it is not that, it's not that significant an issue. That being said, it's always a good idea if you have a house that was built before the 1990s, it's a good idea to get a water quality test, get it checked out just to see where it is. And if you do a water quality test, remember, they should do the first draw for metals. When we take the first sample, that should be taken uh, with water that was laying dormant in the water pipes for at least over overnight, at least six to eight hours. So that's lead in the water supply. What we're gonna be focused on today, primarily well, from here this point forward, basically it's gonna be lead-based paint. And so we're gonna talk about, you know, where, where, where do we see the problems? Uh, we're actually gonna pull up some maps here in this particular region. Uh, and show what some of the, uh, the, the local government officials are doing about things that, uh, that have become, become new, new knowledge actually within the past uh, 10, 15 years. So um, we'll talk about that. So a little bit of background. So lead-based paint, you can see we've got this nice picture here, you know, flashback you know, going back to the 1970s. Uh, probably should have put this bullet point up at the top, but the, 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 the manufacture of paint used in residential applications or, or any, any inhabitable space uh, was banned in 1978. So we knew that lead-based paint was a problem. Uh, that's actually something that was known way before 1978. There were some countries around the world that actually banned the manufacture of lead-based paint going all the way back to the early 1900s. In this country, we didn't do that. Uh, but we just want to make note of that. That date, 1978, when everything looked like this, you know, that cool color scheme and the cool cars and the cool way everybody dressed with the bell bottoms and uh, yeah, the 70s. And so 1978 was the date on which the manufacturer, it's going to be a big, big takeaway here for today, is that you have to keep in mind when talking about a home, you have to know the construction date. Was it built before or after 1978? Uh, so Regina say, I saw a good number of homes, a uh, good number of mid to late 19th century homes in historic areas. Should the public source water be tested? Um, if you have public water, generally as a rule, you know, there's, there's not going to be a, a concern. That being said, you know, as, if, as in a home, if during the home inspection, it's revealed that there is found to be a lead, uh, a lead water supply pipe, and you definitely want to get that checked out. It's not it's not an absolute must, but it's a good idea. Only because you're you, Regina, you're you're getting to find out what you have. There could be a lead-based pipe, a water supply pipe that's connecting from the street and into the house, and maybe they transition to another thing, and we don't have that visibility. So, to err on the side of caution, it's it's a pretty good idea. Uh, you know, we weren't. You know, it, it, does does it apply? You're saying late 19th century homes uh, in historic areas. So we're talking about really really old homes probably not a bad idea in those homes to do that. 
um, only because there is a greater potential. Those are the types of homes that we do find that we have uh, the potential for lead based uh, or actually lead water supply pipes. So it's not a bad idea. Uh, it's not a mandate, but it is a good idea to err on the side of caution. So we know that 1978, getting back to the lead based paint issue, 1978 is the date in which they stopped manufacturing paint with lead in it. And we're going to look at why they put lead in there. It actually helped enhance the color and durability. But uh, we also should know that there are still paints made today, manufactured today, that do contain lead in them. Uh, they're just generally not, they aren't used for residential uh, uh, you know, uh, applications, nor are they used, they're allowed to be used in schools and other you know, ch children occupied facilities. So uh, where is it used? Well, if, if you're driving down the street and you're looking at the paint that's on the asphalt that's used for that reflective paint, pretty good chance that there's some lead in that paint. So that's not paint we're going to be really interacting with or kids are going to be playing with. So uh, we're not as concerned with that. And they do manufacture that as a point of interest. So any paint or surface coating that does contain lead equal to or in excess of one milligram per square centimeter, or if we weigh it, and it, it actually lead makes up the composition of that little sample that we tested. Lead makes up more than one half of 1% of the total weight of that uh, sample that we took. That is considered a public health concern. That's when we think that action should be taken. So uh, note that some states do set lower limits. So, you know, we, we, you know there's, there's certain threshold action uh, threshold limit values in which we should take action when we hit these things or triggered by these things. Um, and we're going to talk about that today. Here in the city of Philadelphia, we're going to talk about the, the lead program, the lead-based paint program that uh, the city of Philadelphia has initiative. It just got kicked off as of October 1st of 2020, just last year. Uh, and we're, they're finishing up, they just finished the first phase. Um, and we'll look at that. And that just finished up in the end of March. So uh, we need to know what all the different regulations are for the different uh, municipalities that we are in. So the primary source the, the, in which we can potentially interact with high concentrations of lead, primarily around homes, the, they are going to be not from necessarily the ingestion, the eating of lead chips, lead-based paint chips. When I was growing up, there were public service announcements um, you know, that we're on TV pretty regularly showing, you know, your low income housing with a kid sitting in the window, just picking, you know, and, and eating paint chips out of the, uh, the window trough around this old wood window. Um, most of the paint that we interact with today has, if it's lead based paint, it's been encapsulated. It's been painted over. There's not a lot of, of uh, exposed lead based paint uh, in any of the structures that we went. Though we still find it. Yeah, it's still there. But uh, the further we would move away from that date of 1978, as intuitively you would certainly think so, uh, you're going to see less and less of that lead-based paint exposed. We thought that was a good thing, but what we're finding out as the CDC and the EPA are testing and looking at this is that it's no longer the ingestion, you know, eating paint chips. You know, you heard that, hey, what'd you do, eat paint chips when you were a kid? You know, that was a slur because... Uh, you know, made you, you know, to implied that somebody, you know, had some kind of mental deficiency because they were eating paint chips. Um, obviously, that's not funny anymore. You know, we have, you know, kids today that still are suffering from that. We're going to look at that. And the, what we're finding is, is that the primary, the leading cause of that is lead contaminated dust. So we have lead based paint in the home, even paint that's been encapsulated is still a source of an issue because of the lead contaminated dust that gets generated from points of friction, doors opening and closing, windows opening and closing, just the vibration, the movement of the house itself. Every, every time I talk about, every time I give one of these classes, I'm actually talking about where do we build these homes? You know, they're built on top of soil and there's constant movement and that movement leads to friction and we get dust and that what we're finding is that the dust in these homes, particularly these older homes built, you know, prior to 1978 is where we're going to find these issues. Uh, we're finding that the, the dust has a high level of lead in it, which is a problem. So why is it a concern? Why do we, you know, why are we paying attention to this? Why are we studying this, you know, as, as, a, um, as a society? You know, why do we consider, you know, a certain you know, levels of this uh, to be a public health concern? Well, it's because 
um, you know, particularly our, our, our young children are very, very much uh, at risk at being exposed to this, primarily because their they're developing bodies are still doing just that, developing. Uh, they're also more likely to be playing on the ground, on the floor, closer to the dust, and putting these, this, these lead contaminated objects into their mouth, getting it on their hands, putting their hands in their mouth, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a problem. So we're going to talk about some of the ways that you can go through uh, and just the, if you live in an older home, some of the things that you should do to minimize the potential for that happening. If this does happening and the kids are getting exposed to a high concentration of lead, uh, we're going to talk about what those levels are. This can lead to brain damage, central nervous system damage, decreased intelligence, learning disabilities, uh, you know, behavioral problems and hyperactivity, uh, among other things. Other people who are at risk are obviously going to be pregnant women who are carrying, uh, you know, a yet to be born uh, child. So, you know, you've got the danger of miscarriage, damage to the fetus and low birth weight. That's a concern. So, and, and even adults who are fully developed, they can still lead to, you know, high blood pressure, fatigue, nervous disorders, muscles or, you know, or joint pain. So, um, you know, think about that. You know, um, you know, think about those symptoms that we're looking at right there. You know, if, if you're going to your doctor and you walk in there and you say, hey, look, I can, you know, check your blood pressure, blood pressure's up. You tell them, look, I feel really tired. And, you know, I, I've got some, you describe some type of nervous disorders, muscles, joint pain. Man, they're going to go through a whole bunch of potential, you know, problems before they land on, oh, well, you've been exposed to high concentration of lead. Uh, wow, is it difficult to diagnose this? You know, quite often symptoms are missed or just completely left untreated. You know, you could, sometimes you go to your doctor and you're suffering from being exposed high, high levels of uh, high blood lead levels. And, you know, it's, you're presenting as if you've got just a, a chronic case of the flu that never wants to seem, you know, never wants to go away. The doctor's going to try and figure out what that is. It's not going to be easy. Because this gets misdiagnosed so often or just not even treated at all, it definitely increases the likelihood of per permanent damage. And we're going to talk today that when you're getting exposed to high, to high concentrations of lead or even moderate concentrations of lead, it has a cumulative effect. It's not like... Um, you know, it's not like, you know, drinking a, you know, a, a, a you know, uh, drinking a glass of beer and that alcohol gets in your system and then dissipates, it's gone. No, um, when you get exposed to lead, the lead gets into the bloodstream and then, then it gets deposited into the marrow in our bones and has a cumulative effect. It, it increases over time. And so this definitely increases the likelihood of permanent damage uh, as it continues to, to increase at, while it's not being diagnosed. The only way to determine if you've got lead poisoning is to take a blood lead level test. So uh, definitely something to you know, keep in mind. If you know somebody that's got some issues that a uh, family member or friend that's you know, complaining that, hey, they got something going on, we can't, doctors can't figure it out, don't know what to do. It's a simple test. It's an inexpensive test. Just might not, might not be a bad idea to suggest. You might wanna get your blood lead level tested to see where you are, to see if that's that's one of the things you can, if nothing else, cross off the list. So how do we prevent lead exposure in the homes that we live in, where we dwell? Well, that's really some pretty simple things that we can do. Remember, you know, we're assuming that all the paint's in really good shape. So all we really have to be concerned about, for the most part, is dust and soil that we could drag in from other areas as well. So we want to make sure we keep our hands washed, keep the toys washed, keep everything really nice and clean. Don't allow any kind of dust to build up. If you're coming in from the outside, remember, we use lead-based paint on the outside of structures. So it's very, very possible that that lead-based paint might be in the soil. And then when we walk in the soil, we bring it into the house, we walk across the floor and the kid's playing right there, right? That can be a problem. Remove your shoes before entering your house. Just switch over to an interior pair of shoes. This applies to running cold water. That's what I was saying earlier. If you live in an older house where you think you might have some lead in the water supply, you want to run that cold water. Let your water just run for a minute or two before you use it first thing in the morning or if the water's been sitting dormant in the pipes for uh, while you're out at work all day. Uh, you want to prevent your children from playing in the soil outside. They can play on the grass or, you know, just as long as everything's been covered over, you just don't want to let them play in that bare soil where those lead paint chips have been falling onto the ground and deteriorating over the years. 
eating a healthy diet, you want to minimize your comorbidities in terms of um, what can affect your, your immune system. So being healthy, you know, maintaining a good weight, and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, I need to lose some weight myself, but um, all good ideas that's going to help you with a myriad of different things, of, you know, keeping in good health and keeping your home well-maintained. Very, very simple, common sense things, right? We're going to watch a video right now, and it's going to kind of walk us through the same thing, just showing us what we want to do, how we can keep our home safe, and how primarily we can keep the, the those that we love safe so that they don't uh, get subjected to or have the potential to get uh, poisoned by lead. Let's watch this. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, there are at least 4 million households that have children living in them that are being exposed to high levels of lead. The CDC goes on to report that there are approximately half a million U.S. children ages 1 through 5 with blood levels above 5 micrograms per deciliter. The reference level at which the agency recommends public health actions be initiated. Children under the age of 6 years old are at high risk because they are growing so rapidly and because they tend to put their hands or other objects which may be contaminated with lead dust into their mouths. Lead poisoning is entirely preventable. The goal is to prevent lead exposure to children before they are harmed. One of the most important things is to find out whether there is any lead-based paint or other sources of lead where you live or where your children play or visit often. If a home was built before 1978, it may contain lead-based paint. It is the deterioration of this paint that causes a significant problem. Fortunately, there are ways to test for lead and there are professionals who are trained to remove any lead-based paint hazards that are found. Tips from the CDC to prevent exposure to lead include the following. Make sure children do not have access to peeling paint or chewable surfaces painted with lead-based paint. Children and pregnant women should not be present in homes built before 1978 that are undergoing renovations. Create barriers between living and play areas from any lead sources until the hazard has been resolved. Regularly wash children's hands and toys because they can become contaminated from household dust or exterior soil. Both are known lead sources. Regularly wet mop floors and wet wipe window components. Take off shoes when entering a house to prevent bringing lead contaminated soil in from outside. Also, prevent children from playing in bare soil where lead hazards may exist. Plant grass on areas of bare soil or cover the soil with mulch or wood chips. These are just a few things to know about lead and preventing exposure to children. To learn more about this or other health and safety, indoor air quality, occupational or environmental issues. So you can see it pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, we just got to keep keep these places clean. When we do our, um, we, we do a, a, an EPA, the protocol that's been developed by the EPA is what's called, what we call a lead safe inspection, which is primarily we're looking to make sure, you know, come in and test. We're going we're to do dust wipes and test everywhere. Uh, that the EPA says that we should. We're going to test windowsills. We're going to you know, get samples from the floor to see what these you know lead contamination levels are with any given structure. And so, uh, one of the first things we recommend: we want you to come in there and thoroughly clean that place before we come in and do our testing. That's definitely the preferred protocol. So um, you know, uh, you know, we can actually. I don't care if we're, if we're literally on our way, as long as we you know you don't clean any sooner than one hour before we get there. That's we really really important that we keep and maintain really clean homes, particularly the older homes, so that we minimize that dust. That's the idea here. Next, we're going to look at uh, Antonio's story. Antonio, he's a the adorable little guy, and you know he has suffered from lead poisoning. So we're going to listen and learn about Antonio and what he's had to uh, undergo. So I think you're gonna fall in love with this little guy. Watch this, watch this video about Antonio's story. Good morning, Antonio. You ain't gave me my hug or kiss this morning. You just done jumped up and you just were ready to go. Okay, I just came to you. So we got to go down here and catch the deadly tree. And I remember when I when I walked into their home, um, 
there was this little boy that was standing in a corner wailing and rocking and <clears throat> seeming like he was about three months old. Um, but at the time he was 18 months old. And when I looked around the corner, I seen him laying up against the wall, facing the wall, and his little fingers was picking the paint off of the wall. And before I got to him, he had put it in his mouth. And he was clinging onto a blanket and, and, and holding this sippy cup. And I'd worked, I worked with children for um, about 10 years now. And my first thought was, this is hopeless. I was like, how, how, how am I going to be able to do anything with this? You know, this, this, this child is, is um, doomed, you know. I was like a person that didn't know what to do. I felt bad. I felt hurt. Uh, I, I'm praying, Lord, uh, God, what should I do? And I'm asking you to come in my life and teach me and show me what to do for my child. Every single week that I would see him, he seemed to grow more and more and and just these changes just happened you know so rapidly it would not have been that way if it weren't for his dad who you know runs around the community bringing him to so many appointments you know that he's really made this his full-time job caring for this child and making sure that Antonio got healthy see the building over there they working on yeah all right Yeah, that's a pretty feather. That's on my yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Okay. Now, hey, what do you do? All right. We're on our way to school. You like that? Okay. Say bye-bye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's a silent killer, you know, that, that okay. you think that you're safe in your home and you think, well, it's, it's been painted over and whatnot, you know, but kids are, they're quick. You know, they're, they're, they use their hands so much more than we do. And, you know, where do those hands go in their mouth? You know, and it doesn't take much for, you know, these small bodies to be poisoned by lead. Um, it's something that all parents should should be aware of and that to to have lead levels checked because you know it, especially in this case you know it wasn't until Antonio's lead levels were really high that he started to show such serious symptoms um, so you know at this point Antonio is getting ready to enter preschool um, you know and and the two biggest concerns that I still have with him are, are one his hearing loss and um, two it's it's his social emotional development. It's, it's almost like he forgets that he now has language that he didn't have for you know two and a half years of his life. That, you know, and, and so I constantly am reminding him and Mr. Stone, his dad, to you know, help him remember that you can use your words. You, know, you can tell us what you want. I like me fast, I like me slow. I like me everywhere I go. Where are they going? Hmm? Where are they going? To the mountain. They're going to the mountain. She mountain. I like me on the inside too. For all I think and say and do. What's this? Dog bone. It is a dog bone. Are you done with the book? Or do you want me to keep reading? My dad. I want another book. You want another? Do you want to pick it out? Okay. 
Why don't you come pick it up? Come here. Come pick it up. I am as like a, a AA uh, person. I'm taking one day at a time and thanking God for each day that he gives me him and that he's in good health. So you can see, uh, you know, it's a sad story you know, with Antonio. Unfortunately, he's getting help, seems to be getting better, but uh, it's a long, hard road. And so, you know, this is why we take this seriously. This is why we bring an awareness to it. This is why the EPA is doing what they're doing in terms of we're going to look at the protocol, the developments, the, the programs that they develop. We're looking at the city of Philadelphia, which is actually one of the, the later cities to actually take action with this. There's a lot of other cities across the country that have already implemented and adopted the EPA's lead safe protocol. Uh, so we're gonna look at that today in, in terms of what that is, you know, what, what's the protocol involved? What's the program involved? So, um, you know, that's kind of what we're gonna be unpacking. You're also gonna hear during the, the class today, you'll probably hear a couple different sources and you're gonna hear variations in terms of, you know, what is the actual scope of the issue? You know, this, this slide here saying 45 to 50 million homes contain some lead-based paint. Um, you know, the, the, it's, it's, you're going to hear some, you know, some variations might be as little as maybe 35 million. It's somewhere between 35 to 50 million, a significant, you know, chunk of the population. Uh, you know, particularly, you know, obviously, we're talking about older homes. You know, looking at the uh, met, uh, yeah, metric matrix up here, you can see that, you know, if we go to 1960 to 1978, 18 years prior to the, 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 the cessation of the manufacturing of uh, lead-based paint for residential applications, homes in the 18 years leading up to that, but roughly 24% of them have lead-based paint in them. So what's that tell us? Remember, I said that countries all over the world started phasing that out as early as the, the, the very early 1900s, where they realized that this was a public health concern, we need to phase this out. We were really late to the game in this country in terms of that. And so uh, you were kind of paying the price today. So, uh, and we have been paying the price. So uh, in terms of, you know, where that, what that looks like, homes built between 1960 and 1978, you know, 24% of those homes approximately have lead-based paint in them. You go beyond that, you can see uh, the eight, the 19 years prior to that, 1940 to 1959, almost 70% of those homes have lead-based paint. And then homes built before 1940, almost 90% of those, those homes have that. So we're talking about a significant number of homes in this country that have the potential for uh, lead contaminated duct, lead based paint, if it hasn't been already mitigated and covered and encapsulated and uh, dealt with. Uh, and then even if it has, we still have the potential for that lead contaminated dust to be in the home. Uh, and so we really need to bring an awareness to that. And so that's kind of what, what we do with our inspections when we do testing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we approach that as that this is something we need to educate people on. And uh, you know something you guys can do as well. I mean, you are in the real estate business and you are there on the front line with clients who have this concern. Nothing more important than creating a great user experience for your clientele, correct? So what do we mean by that? Well, it means that, you know, if you've got somebody that calls you up, just like Patty shared, you know, she called one of the agents out there, called up and said, hey, can you help me find a home for my family? Uh, that begins the user experience. And the user experience isn't just till you get to the settlement table and get paid. The user experience, your frame of reference for that actually extends well beyond that. Not only do you want to do a great job of walking them through the process of you know, buying a home, transacting on it, but you also want to have, to have them have a great experience after they've moved into that home, they've settled in that home, they're living comfortably in that home. We also want to make sure that they are living healthily in that home that uh, we're, we're not finding a home and helping them move into a home that might actually present some kind of uh, health issues to them. And so you know, there's no way of knowing it, whether you are or not, but there's some things that we can do on a, on, on a, a, a proactive basis to, to help in, in that outcome to be the case, right? 
So that's what we want to do. That's the great user experience we're looking for. Yeah, you want to help somebody find the home of their dreams, help them move into it, help them transact on it, but also to move comfortably and healthy, living in that home with their family for many, many years to come. And if you do are if you are successful in that, they're going to turn around and refer you to other people. So uh, not only is it just simply a matter of just doing the right thing, it's also there is some incentive behind it as well. Uh, for you to to make sure that your clients will continue to refer you. So it really helps. For me, that's the way I approach my business as a home inspector. My frame of reference is from the time they call us up to schedule an, an inspection to after they've moved into that home. That's what I always use as a frame of reference when I'm teaching, you know, when we're training inspectors, I'm training my staff. I want them to understand that this is the user experience that I want people to be focused on. I want you to be focused on. Uh, I want them to, we want, we're going to do a great job from the time we first communicate with them to the time we do the inspection, to the time we deliver the report for all the follow-up with a keen focus that I want them to move into a house being educated on what it is that they're moving into. Not to scare them. I'm not looking to scare anybody. I don't want, I don't want this to be a scary proposition at all. In fact, it's my job, not to, not to make them feel good about their purchase, but to help them tone back that anxiety just by simply bringing educating your knowledge is power you have that power now that you have that knowledge you have that power now you can walk through with clarity with you know um, transparency move forward with the transaction just simply knowing what you have and having all the information that you need to to, to move forward that's the way we approach it so <clears throat> we've talked about this and like I said for me, it was the, the idea, you know, and been doing this for years, I always had it in the back of my mind that knowing that 1978 was the date in which, um, you know, we, we're gonna, we've stopped manufacturing this. Intuitively, I just thought that, you know, as we move forward, the whole lead-based paint thing is going to become uh, a less and less of an issue. In fact, we saw that in our business, you know, uh, years and years ago, we did a lot more testing for, for lead-based paint. It's actually diminished. But what we're starting to see, number one, the protocol has completely changed as we're going to look at that. We used to offer what we called a visual assessment for lead-based paint that was done in accordance with HUD guidelines. Um, HUD's kind of done away with that program. We would also do some grab sampling of some paint chips, send them off to the lab just to you know do a sample and see if we do, in fact, have lead-based paint as a grab sample, just to give us a, a primary indication. We don't do that anymore, primarily because the EPA has come and developed a, a protocol that, that we now follow and we're actually mandated to follow. Uh, it's, a, it's a government regulation that we have to follow. So, you know, intuitively, I just thought that this would be a non-issue the further we moved away from it and all this paint got covered over and it would just kind of go away. Well, that's not the case. The old paint, yes, it's been covered over and and all this paint is in good shape and we don't, you know, most of the time we go into a place and doing a, an EPA lead safe inspection, most of the paint that we see, even in rental units, is in pretty decent shape. Might not be perfect, but it's in pretty decent shape. You can tell it's been painted over a few times. So, you know, the question is, so, so then what's the problem? Well, like we said, it's not the deteriorated paint, the exposure of deteriorated paint. It's the, the very, very small amounts of lead contaminated dust, which can poison children and adults. So this can be breathed in every day. Particles are really, really small. If you're somebody who goes out and does remodeling, you can go out and you know, do your job and bring lead contaminated dust home to your family. You know, lead contaminated dust, you can't see it, it's dust. It's, you know, it's basically invisible to the eye. Floors that look to be clean can be contaminated. Smaller particles, you know, more easily absorbed than larger particles, it can, can travel around. So um, you know, these are why when we do renovation jobs or if you're moving into a house that's just been flipped or, um, you know, you move, you're living in a house and you're doing some remodeling, this is where uh, the EPA became really, really concerned. It's one thing to live in a house and it's just, hey, we just got to keep this house clean. It's a whole nother thing to go in and do major renovation within a house and, that, and disturb all these undisturbed services. Uh, so that's why the EPA came forward and developed um, uh, a, you know, a protocol called the, the Renovation Repair and Painting Program, the RRP. We're going to look at that in a second. 
They establish a training and certification program for workers, for supervisors, for inspectors and risk assessors, anybody that's going to do any kind of work on lead-based paint. If you're going to disturb lead-based paint or if you're going to have any inspection relating to lead-based paint, you need to follow this EPA established mandated protocol. Uh, this has been adopted by HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. They've actually adopted the, the EPA's protocol. Um, you know, they, 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 all the EPA's protocol is, is used to establish the grant programs, guidelines for lead-based paint evaluation. Like I said, we used to use the HUD's, the EPA had their protocol, HUD had their own protocol. What we're seeing is, is that HUD's eliminating their protocol and adopting the EPA's protocol. Uh, and they, that's where they came up with this lead safe housing rules. The, the lead safe terminology, we're going to talk about some of the acronyms and the terminology that we're using here today uh, and unpack that for you even at a higher, higher level. But that lead safe uh, lingo here is actually, again, developed by the EPA. OSHA, same thing, you know, worker standards. And they've, they've actually uh, adopted some of the EPA stuff in terms of it's one thing to go out and do a job out in the field. Another thing to, you know, what are you doing when you're done at the end of the day and what are you doing to keep yourself safe? So uh, these regulations are not optional. Uh, as we're going to learn, they are mandated and they are uh, being enforced. So what is the lead-based paint renovation and repair and painting program? The RRP is what we're going to, you're going to hear that acronym over and over again. So it's the the renovation, repair, and painting program that the, the EPA developed. Well, it's a federal regulatory program affecting contractors, property managers, anybody who has the potential doing their job who can disturb painted surfaces. And this, this is not, you know, this doesn't apply to a home that was built in 1995. It applies to residential homes, apartments, child-occupied facilities, schools, daycare centers built before 1978. So if, if, if you have a, a structure that was built, uh, actually it's March of 1978 or before, then in fact, you have to uh, follow the RRP rule. And so uh, the, the rule includes a, a pre-renovation education requirements as well as training and certification and work practice <coughs> requirements. So there's a whole program that they put forth, excuse me. Uh, you know, training that you've got to go through, uh, processes and protocols out in the field when you're doing renovation that you must follow, a means of documenting that, uh, record keeping, all of that stuff must be done um, in order to be in compliance with this regulatory program. Who has to follow this? Well, we kind of hinted at it already. Anybody, and it's real, make us real simple, anybody who is paid to perform works that disturbs paint in any housing or child occupied facilities built before 1978 falls under the purview of this program. That's residential rental property matters, you know, property owners, property managers. If you own a property and let's say you own your house and you own one other rental unit, if you are getting, if you're collecting rent on that property and you go there and do any work there yourself, you're required to follow this rule. If you hire any contractors come in and do any work there where the paint may be disturbed, they are required to comply with this and you should be hiring people that are in compliance with this rule. That's general contractors, specialty trade contractors, painters, plumbers, carpenters, electricians, HVAC techs, this list is not even close to being complete. You know, security system installers, you know, anybody who is any type of contractor, uh, you know, or, you know, any kind of trade that you would might come in and disturb any of the services, you are required to go through the training, get the certification, maintain the certification, follow the protocol out in the field. And there's nobody that's really excluded from this. Um, you know, there's, <laughs> the other thing is, is that until we started teaching this class, you know, until actually it was prior to teaching this class, I'm not sure which happened first. Either we went and got our own certification uh, or we started teaching this class, I'm not sure which, but we were unaware of this ourselves. And I know that there's a lot of people that are just completely unaware of the, even the existence, existence of this programs. Contractors I know of 
that, that I talk to, they're just like, huh, what, what are you talking about? I don't know anything about this. Um, well, it's something that you want to be aware of because the EPA actually enforces this. And we're going to talk about their, their, their enforcement here in just a minute. So again, yeah, Elizabeth said, wow, I never heard of this program. Good to know. Yeah, exactly, Elizabeth. So um, I really need to check and see when this thing was really rolled out and developed. So it's, it, this is pretty new. I mean, um, you know, I, like I said, I, just, just to, until within the past year and a half or so, uh, I had an unawareness of it. And I think that, you know, this thing was really starting to be put together and starting to be rolled out uh, going back early in the, um, the, the, the 20 teens, if you will. Uh, I don't know if it was 2013, 2012, 2013, somewhere in that time frame. I want to verify that. I need to make myself a note. Apologize for that. So I want to find that out for myself now that I'm asking myself the question. But uh, yeah, so this is you know something that, that needs to be followed. And so renovators, they must go through, they have to get certified. They have to go through training. And this isn't just reading a pamphlet or even going online and just doing an online course, uh, the, the require what they require, we had to go through this all of our, uh, we'll talk about inspectors here in just a minute, but uh, we are a, a, an EPA certified, lead safe certified firm. And everybody who's an inspector for us went out and got their lead safe certification. And it not, wasn't something we could go online and get. You have to go in and sit in, in person, face to face, in person, classroom training, hands on training, uh, to, to prove that you've learned the material and that you're proficient in doing uh, the work. Uh, if you are a firm that hires led, you know, that hires uh, people to go out and do the work, your firm must be certified. You have to use accredited training providers. So if, if you are um, you know, a, a, a remodeler, a renovator, somebody that goes out and does this work, a, a tradesman who does this work, you have to go to an accredited training provider. It's not just you can't go to anybody to get this training. They have to have been approved by the EPA. And then once you've gotten your accreditation, you've gotten your training, you've gotten your accreditation, you have to go out and utilize these work safe practices that you have learned. And uh, like I said, the EPA is, uh, you know, looking over our shoulders. And so the RRP rule, Patty just did a little research. Thank you, Patty. Uh, it has actually been out there in, in effect since April 22nd of 2010. So this has actually been around for about 11 years now. And so, um, you know, a lot of people are still completely unaware of it. So thank you, Patty. I appreciate that. So any firm, you know, working in a pre-1978 home, the home that was built prior, built on or before March of 1978 and or any child occupied facilities, daycare centers, uh, schools, you know, they have to be certified using lead safe work practices. So uh, the, the firms have to be using these lead safe work practices. The firm certification. So firms, what do we have to do? Well, basically, we've got to put ourselves on the EPA's radar. So we have to, if we're going to go out and do work um, and do any kind of renovation work, or as an inspection firm as we are, our firm must become a lead safe certified firm. Real estate inspections is a EPA lead safe certified firm. This is our, our, our national, our firm's the number in the national database. And this certification is good for five years. Now, firms don't have to go through any education because the firm is just an entity itself. All we get to do is have the privilege of paying the EPA um, a nice fee to be able to be on their radar, uh, but it's required. So if you are a firm that goes out and does any of this work, either it be renovating or uh, any of the inspections, you have to be uh, certified by the EPA and you pay the fee to do so. But then all of your installers, any of your individual renovators, and we'll talk a minute about inspectors, they are required to be, uh, to go through the training. And so they have to take at a minimum an eight hour training per, you know, course. Now uh, there's different levels. So if you're just a, a, a renovator, somebody that might be disturbing paint when you're, when you're working, that's an eight hour course, but there's different levels of courses. If you're actually getting into where you're doing lead paint abatement or uh, lead, lead based paint mitigation, uh, you are actually going to have to go through significantly more training to do that. So the eight hour training is just for anybody who's going to be a contractor who may be going out doing any work where they're disturbing it in the process of doing whatever their trade is. 
So once they go through that, that EPA training course, that's actually a hands-on course where they, you're actually required to not only understand from a knowledge perspective uh, and have a good acquisition of knowledge, but you're also uh, trained physically in doing the work that you're supposed to do and taking, following the protocol hands-on and that's it to, to a level of proficiency. So once you complete that, that's your certification and that's good for five years. Then after five years, you gotta take the course over again. So that's how they're maintaining uh, a level of education on this particular rule, the RRP rule. Inspectors, no different. So inspectors, there are th actually three different levels of EPA inspector certification. The dust sampling technician is what all of our team is. Um, I myself, as well as all of our inspectors, we are EPA lead safe certified dust sampling technicians. And we, uh, you know, have gone through the course. It was an eight hour course. We all had to go in classroom training uh, while we were social distancing and go through the course and get that certification. Um, there are also other levels, the lead paste, the lead paint inspector and the risk assessor. Basically, if you are going to oversee work being done, you need to you know, get uh, and, and comply with these higher levels of inspector certification. All of them require the in-classroom training with hands-on experience through an EPA accredited training provider. And just like the renovators, the course completion is your certification and we're required to retake that course every five years. So uh, the EPA is actually out there enforcing this. And so, uh, you know, you might think, well, this is a regulation that was rolled out in 2010. I haven't really heard anything about it. Well, the EPA is actually actively looking for violators. And then if you are a violator, you can be fined up to $37,500 for each violation. Uh, this is for a non-compliant firm. So uh, there's really not, so if you are a renovator out there, generally you are uh, working under the umbrella of a company and that company is the one that actually gets uh, hit with the violation because it's really the company's responsibility to maintain uh, the rule of law in terms of compliance with the regulation, as well as the documentation required, the training required. Uh, firms who willingly violate this regulation may be, may be hit with those fines, uh, as we said, 37.5, or imprisonment, or both. So this is something that they're taking very, very seriously. And the reason they're taking it seriously is because of the, the, the health implications of this, as we've looked at here. We're going to look at, in just a, a couple minutes here, we're going to look at the, uh, for instance, the city of Philadelphia, what they're doing and the, 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 the protocol that they have in place. So who doesn't have to follow this rule? Well, <laughs> it's pretty straightforward, uh, a DYI. So if you are doing work in your own house, you do not have to. So homeowners doing their own repairs, they're not required to follow the RRP rule. That being said, the EPA does have a, a, a wealth of information on how even homeowners themselves can go about and do re home remodeling and the precautions they should take. So still highly recommended to follow the EPA's protocol in terms of doing even repairs on your own home, but uh, they are not going to be subject to oversight and regulation by the EPA as, as is, you know, as are all of the other uh, tradespeople and inspectors. So just good to know. So what's the bottom line here? Well, the first and foremost, like I said, this is one of the big takeaways of today. You have to be aware of the date of construction. Uh, if you're involved in a real estate transaction, really important. You guys, I'm sure you know, we're gonna kind of just highlight very quickly some of the laws that are in place. Congress enacted laws to make people aware, uh, home buyers aware, uh, when they're buying a home that was built in 1978 or before, there's disclosures and there's documentations that must be provided to them. Excuse me, that's why it's really important uh, that uh, we know what the date of construction is accurately. We also want to be aware that, hey, we want to make the assumption that if this house was built uh, you know, 1978 or before, we want to, you know, make the assumption that there is lead-based paint in the house. We want to make, there's certainly a possibility of it. We want to operate under the assumption that there is lead-based paint and err on the side of caution in terms of the steps that we take to protect uh, our clients, our family, you know, our loved ones. So just want to be aware that there are accreditations uh, that the EPA requires. And whenever you're hiring somebody, 
Uh, now that you have an awareness to it, you want to make sure that you're asking the people that you hire if they're going to be disturbing paint in and around the structure, in and around the structure doing any renovation process. Do they have and are they in compliance with the RRP regulation? So sorry about that. I guess he's saying he is in compliance. So, <laughs> so know the lingo. We talked about this. Excuse me, guys. Let me close the door. So uh, the lingo, you know, we talked about the RRP acronym. You remember what that stands for renovation, repair, and painting proto protocol, the, the program that the EPA has in place. It's it's a the program is taking measures to, to make sure that firms performing this type of work are using trained and certified renovators and they are following the lead safe work practices. That's pretty pretty straightforward. So uh, that's what the RRP program is all about. And again, it does, there is oversight in terms of inspectors as well. So just bringing everybody under the same umbrella, following the same protocol. And remember I said that this is being widely adopted even by other governmental regulatory or, you know, uh, uh, organizations, the Department of uh, Urban Housing and Development. Um, you know, everybody's pretty much on board with this. And so uh, it's good to know that it's around and what, what this is about. Uh, the LBP, that's an acronym for lead-based paint. LBP abatement, we haven't really talked about this yet. So you may have heard about the term lead-based paint abatement. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it's permanently removing lead-based paint and lead-based paint hazards from a home. It is very expensive. And so that's why you, you may have heard the term but you probably haven't been involved or, or been made aware of any home that has gone through this process. Maybe you have, but it is extremely rare. Uh, most of the time, the, the, the structures that are going undergoing lead-based paint abate, abatement are like schools and uh, other institutional facilities, um, you know, maybe government buildings, those kinds of things. Uh, because they have the money to do it. The reality of it is it is extremely expensive. Uh, give you an example. Most of the time, like if you're, I was going to do lead-based paint abatement in my house, um, I'm not going to spend the time to go through the labor of removing all of the paint off of my trim work that will trim around the windows, the windowsills and stuff. I'm just going to remove that trim work and get rid of it and clean up. Same thing with the walls. Uh, it's just so, so expensive that... Um, it's just not something that's done, particularly re with regard to real estate transactions. So where we're going to be focusing on is the lead safe protocol. But before we get to that, we want to talk about the difference between lead safe and lead free. So lead free is just what it sounds like. It's a condition in which the interior and exterior of a property do not contain any lead based paint and the property contains no lead contaminated soil or lead contaminated dust. Lead free. It's just not there. Um, so what kind of properties can have this? Basically, there's two types of properties that can have this condition. One, it was a property in which there was never any lead-based paint on the property to begin with. That was a, a building that was built last year or in the 90s, but not a, not a home that was built uh, you know, prior to 1978. And or it's a home in which the, uh, it has gone through this lead abatement and gotten certified to be lead-free. So primarily lead-free homes are homes that never had lead-based paint to begin with um, and or their homes that went through lead abatement, a few of which there are very, very few out there. Primarily where, what we're going for here, this is why the, the RRP program is called the Lead Safe Program. This is why uh, if you type in uh, Philly Lead Safe, it's gonna bring up, and this is what I'm referring to, uh, the, the rental property lead certification law and you can see right here, a property must be beginning of October 2020. Landlords will be required to test and certify that their properties are uh, basically lead safe or lead free. So if you have a property that was built, you know, after, uh, say, 1978, you know, you're just going to get a lead free certification on that. If you have a property that was built before then, you are looking to get a lead safe certification or a lead free certification if you get it but getting a lead free certification on an older home is not that easy to do. Uh, and so we're gonna unpack this here a little bit more for you. Um, but 
this is where most people are going to be going for a real estate transaction. If somebody wants to get a lead, lead, uh, lead based paint test, they want to know whether or not the property has any, any lead based paint hazards in it. We're going to perform an EPA lead safe inspection. And what does that include? Well, it includes doing dust sampling uh, at different locations throughout the home. We'll talk about what that, what that entails. Uh, so what is lead safe? Well, it's the condition in which a property is free of a condition that causes or may cause exposure to lead from lead contaminated dust, from lead contaminated soil, deteriorated lead-based paint, deteriorated presumed lead-based paint, or other similar threat of lead exposure due to the condition of the property itself. So kind of got to unpack the language there a little bit. It is a, you know, the lead-free is simply a condition of which there isn't any lead contaminated issues whatsoever. This is a condition in which the property is free from a condition in which the property is free from a condition. That's pretty confusing language there. It was written that way intentionally. Basically, what the lead safe inspection does is number one, it lets you know at the time of the inspection whether or not there are any elevated lead content, lead, um, you know, issues. Um, you know, so we're, we're going to use certain threshold limit values. Uh, if, for instance, if we're testing the floor, there's one value. If we're testing a windowsill, it's another value. And we do, we test those locations. Uh, we want to make sure also that the house is free, clean, and there's no deteriorated, significantly deteriorated paint. So what are we doing? We're, we're actually doing a test in which we're certifying that at the time of the inspection, this proper, the property either had attained a lead safe status or, and or it failed and needs to do uh, a cleaning in order to achieve a lead safe status. So basically it's being used to bring the property into a state of condition that that point forward needs to be maintained so that the house considered to be lead safe. That's kind of tricky. So we do our inspection certifying it either is or is not. And then if it is, that gives you a baseline at which that house needs to be maintained at that baseline going forward in, in order for it to be safe. If we come in and you do a great job cleaning everything up and it passes and then you don't clean again, you're not maintaining a lead safe condition. Um, so that needs to be understood. But that's, that's what this is about. And that's the difference between the two. So lead safe means there is no lead anywhere to be found. Uh, lead safe means that we are have a condition in which uh, it is at this particular point in time is considered to be lead safe free of any lead contaminated hazards. Also want to know the state and local regulations. This is what I was talking about. You know, to give you an example, and when we do an EPA lead safe inspection for a real estate transaction, we um, test basically four rooms. EPA says we have to test a minimum of four rooms. So that's what we do. We can do them more if you want, but we're going to meet that EPA minimum requirement of four rooms. Generally, we're going to do a couple bedrooms. We're going to do generally the kitchen and maybe the living room, something like that. And in each one of those rooms, we're testing two locations. So we're actually testing, uh, doing eight samples is what we're doing. And actually it's nine samples because we throw in a quality assurance, a quality control blank. Uh, so the lab has a blank to test just to have a baseline to compare against. So we'll do nine different samples and uh, the eight samples that we actually collect that are actual real samples, we do a, a, a one by one, a 12 inch by 12 inch section of floor in that given room. And we do a section of the windowsill in that given room. And we test the floor and a windowsill in each of those rooms. That's what the EPA says we have to do at a minimum. Now, if we're talking about the differences between state and local regulations and federal regulations, if we look at this particular program that the city of Philadelphia has instituted, this program requires that landlords, if we follow the rules, um, they are going to actually, we're going to have to, if it's a, <coughs> say a three bedroom unit, we have to, we have to test not just a minimum of four rooms. We have to test all inhabitable rooms. <coughs> Excuse me. So if there's three bedrooms, a living room, a dining room, a kitchen, and say um, a, a closed in porch in which the kids play, we have to test all those. We have to test all three bedrooms. We have to test the living room, the dining room, uh, the kitchen, and the porch. That's eight rooms. That's twice as many rooms as we have to test 
to meet the, the federal regulations for the city of Philadelphia and where, where it's a rental property, they want all of the rooms tested. And so it's obviously it's a little more expensive to do the test to be in compliance with the city of Philadelphia's rental property lead certification law than it is to do a lead safe inspection in, in a compliance with the EPA's protocol. So again, why do we do all this? And you wanna be aware of these different regulations. We're gonna look at one of the uh, videos coming up uh, and it's something that, um, you know, with the, in the example that we're gonna give, you're gonna hear a, a number that's that the, uh, the city, uh, Los Angeles County, for example, has a different regulation than say does the city of Philadelphia in terms of the threshold limit value. That's not uncommon. You always wanna be aware of what the local regulations are, are requiring, not just go by the federal guideline because quite often those local regulations are even more stringent than the federal guidelines. So um, determining if lead-based pain is present. Why do we do it? Let's go back to, before I, wanna, before I move on, I wanna highlight this Philadelphia program. This is why we're doing what we are doing. I want you guys to take a look at this map and you're gonna see what this map is. So this map is showing you the percent of screen children with blood lead levels higher than five micrograms per deciliter, and, and it organizes it by zip code. And I was utterly shocked when I saw what this particular, uh, you know, uh, let me just make this a little bit smaller, what, what this map shows us. So if we look at this map, we can see that all of these zip codes here that are at red, which are a big chunk of the city of Philadelphia, in here, we're talking about, you can see I'm kind of pointing to it here. <clears throat> if you live in this zip code, roughly upwards of 15% of the kids that live in this zip code actually have tested for blood lead levels, lead blood lead levels that are above what we consider to be a public health concern. 15% of the kids that were screened that blew my mind. I couldn't believe it. Like I said, I thought that the further we moved away from 1978, this would become less and less of an issue. We're seeing that that is just simply not the case. Um, and then just looking at these other ones, you know, arranging, you know, these gold or these goldenrod colors in these zip codes, you know, anywhere from around six to almost 9%. And then even in the ones where it's not as bad, you know, you still have Still, that's that when you add all of these up just in the city of Philadelphia, how many kids are we talking about? That is an alarming number of children who have have high blood lead levels. That that's just blowing my mind, and it, it continues to blow my mind when I look at this and just think of you know the, the kids and what they're going through, uh, and the the family, the issues that come as a result of that. You saw you know Antonio's dad, and how much care he needs to you know give them, taking them all over the place. To get treatment for the you know the poor little guy, you know, just blows my mind when I, when I when I think about it. But this is why the EPA is doing what they're doing, and this is just the city of Philadelphia. You know, we live in, and you know, we talked about that matrix, which shows the, the percentage of, of homes that have um, lead in them and where the the the, the hazard exists potentially exists. Uh, but we're in, we're in a part of the country where the, the numbers are probably skewed even higher because we just have, you know, we're, we're an older part of the country. We have a lot of older homes. We have an inordinately, um, um, an inordinate amount of older homes because of the amount of old homes we have in this region. So uh, it's even more important in the area that we serve to be focused on this stuff. <clears throat> so how do we determine if lead-based paint is actually there? How do we determine if in fact there is even an issue to be concerned about, right? Well, uh, the EPA says we have to test <clears throat> If we're actually going to test, we have to test all surfaces. And so we're going to look at the different methodologies that are out there, the different technologies that are out there to, to be able to do the testing that we do. Now, if we have a home that's built prior to 1978, we don't want to say, oh, I'm sure we're fine. We'll get it checked out. But we'll know after we get it checked out. No, we want to make the presumption and operate under the assumption that all paint is affected. In other words, we have to, if we're having, and we have a home built before 1978, we want to make the assumption it does contain lead-based paint. And then when we do the testing, the testing should be performed by a qualified professional. There are self-test kits out there, um, but what we have found, and we're going to talk about you know, one in particular, which is by far and away the most popular one, uh, it's been determined to be um, 
not as accurate as we had hoped that it was going to be when it first came out 10 years ago. It actually came out in conjunction with the release of the RRP rule in about 2010. So let's take a look at some of these things. This is the first one we're talking about. So there's different types of lead tests that are out there. The first one we're going to look at is made by the 3M company. You're probably familiar with 3M. I think they make scotch tape and I think they might make the, uh, the little stickies I have all over my desk. Um, you know, they also make a lead check swab kit. And so the cool thing about their kit, uh, and, and by the way, this was used. We actually had this available to us to use um, that, you know, we could use it in the field. We opted not to use it because of the, it's invasive. It, it, you have to damage surfaces. So we can't go in and damage the surface of seller's house if we're doing our test. But, um, you know, if somebody was actually doing it and they actually used this uh, early on, uh, in the EPA lead safe era, this, this was actually used and approved by the EPA until they found out that it actually uh, created some undesirable, an undesirable rate of false positive uh, results. And it can also provide false negative results. So we don't use this anymore. The cool thing about it is that it's color metric. What that means is it's basically a little swab and you swab the area. And if it turns red, it's lead. That was their little slogan. If it's red, it's lead. Um, it's actually yellow when it first comes out. So if it actually changes color from yellow to red, then it means there's lead there. The problem, one of the problems is that it is intrusive. As you're going to see, we're going to watch a video of how this particular kit works. Excuse me. I had chili for once, so please pardon me. Um, the intrusive, it's intrusive. In other words, we have to actually come in and take a utility knife and score all the surfaces that are going to be test. So it does damage those surfaces. So that's why we couldn't use it in conjunction with a, a real estate inspection. Uh, so it's, it gives you quick results. That's the cool thing about it. There is a little bit of invasive. You do have to damage the surface, but the neat thing, you didn't have to send it off to a lab. Well, we're, we're, we can't use this. It's not reliable. The EPA has, has yanked the, the, uh, the approval for it. So it's not approved for most regu by regu most regulating authorities. Um, and so pretty much anything we do, we're going to have to collect samples and send off to a lab. That's where we are with it today. So uh, let's watch this quick video. It's actually going to walk you through and show you exactly how this lead, lead check swab kit works. I actually think it's a really cool kit. This is still readily available. You can buy it on Amazon. You can go to Home Depot and pick this up. Uh, so if you want to do this on your own to check your own house out, just to get a, a quick indication of what you think you might have, this is a great way to do it without having to take, take samples and send them off to a lab. So let's watch this video and see how this particular kit works. Okay, so we need to show you how easy it is to check for lead on painted wood and metal surfaces using 3M lead check swabs. Okay, let's do it. You want to swab or should I? You swab, I'll talk. That works. Take a look at this old wood window frame. Lead-based paint? We'll find out. You need a new 3M lead check swab for each area you test, and they come in these handy two packs. Cut into wood with a clean razor blade when there are layers of paint. Then, clean the blade so you don't cross-contaminate. Activate the ingredients when you're ready to test the surface. And with the cardboard cover in place, like so, squeeze the tube on both ends, like this. You can hear and feel the glass ampule break. Then, shake, shake, shake and squeeze until you see liquid at the tip of the swab. The liquid stays active for just 90 seconds. Now rub it on the surface while you gently squeeze the sides of the tube. You're good. Nice swabbing technique. <laughs> Thanks. It's all in the wrist. Now, if there is lead in the paint, you will see a pinkish red reaction right away. If not, rub until color develops, but not longer than 30 seconds. Whew, we're good. No pink or red color change on the swab or surface. We'll just double check by squeezing a drop on the test confirmation card. And the circle should instantly turn pink or red, like that. 
the swab is indeed working. If the swab had turned red on the window, we would need to call an EPA-certified lead-safe contractor. You know, red means lead. Okay, what else can we swab? I'm into this. Right this way. So like I said, you can pick that up. Uh, it's, you can pick it up at, like I said, Home Depot, Amazon. It's, um, it's cool for homeowners to do it. And that's basically what we consider that to be a homeowner self-test kit. So Letha says, when you cut up, aren't you disturbing the paint and risking lead dust? Yeah, so I mean, what, that's one of the, the drawbacks to that is it is intrusive. And so uh, you're only just you know, scoring it. So, you know, uh, technically, uh, and then you're quickly putting something wet on it, which is actually what the protocol is when you're doing disturbing is, is to wet the area. But yes, so that's, that's why we don't utilize that methodology. We actually prefer to use uh, methodology that doesn't do anything to disturb the paint when we do the testing. One of those actually is the X-ray fluoroscopy. That's the X-ray fluorescence testing. Now this requires a specially trained EPA certified lead inspector or risk assessor. We don't do this. Uh, the one we do is what we're going to show you uh, uh, in a couple is the, the, the dust collection. Um, <clears throat> the X-ray fluoroscopy also is not used it's used to test to see if there's lead-based paint there uh, and also in what quantity it is there. It is not used to determine, for instance, it can't be used in order to obtain a lead-safe certification because a lead-safe certification uh, can only be done doing the swabs for the dust collection. Uh, it can be used if you're trying to get a lead-free certification because you can use the x-ray fluoroscopy to actually certify that there either is no lead-based paint present and or if it is present, it's, it's below the levels which are a public health concern. Um, so that's the cool thing about it. And so you have to, it's specialized equipment, it's expensive equipment. Uh, it's actually just a little gun. We're gonna show you a video on how it works. Uh, basically they just go around, pull the trigger and they're actually taking um, you know, measurements where they're actually just everywhere they, they point and aim, they put it on the surface, they're bombarding that particular surface with gamma radiation. And when, when the gamma rays hit the surface, if there's lead there, it emits the x-rays and the sensor reads it. And it also reads the intensity, which it measures it in terms of a, a concentration and it returns that particular result showing there, yes, there is lead-based paint or no, there isn't. And if there is, what is the level of lead-based paint that is existing. And so that tells them what, what areas, if you're trying to get uh, lead abatement or lead-free lead certification, what areas need to be stripped down and removed. So not something we use really with a real estate transaction, but more so uh, to be in compliance with, um, you know, uh, more, more or less you know, municipal regulation. So definitely more expensive because you got expensive equipment, you got expensive training, higher level certification by the inspector to do, who was doing it. And so um, not done anywhere near as often. The cool thing is, is that you aren't, don't have to send the results off to the lab. You get the results back instantaneously. So here's a video showing you exactly how this particular technology works. Pretty cool. In Southern California, like much of the rest of the country, hundreds of thousands of homes were built before lead paint was banned in 1978. In fact, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development estimates more than 38 million homes still contain lead paint, and that one in four American houses contains some type of lead hazard. And why was lead used in paint in the first place? Because it made paint moisture-proof and durable. The city of Los Angeles is required by law to send inspectors to every rental unit in a multifamily building to look for code violations, including peeling paint. They find the oldest housing, the largest buildings, places where we know there will be a higher risk. To confirm the presence of lead in paint, a special lead inspector will systematically go through the home, room by room, testing samples of the painted surfaces. This is done using a handheld X-ray fluorescence device called an XRF gun. 
It finds lead by reading the unique set of characteristic fluorescence X-rays that lead emits. It's like a detective finding lead's fingerprint at the scene. We'll test the sash first. Um, 8.2 milligrams per square centimeter. So that's considered to have lead. It's way above the 0 0.7 milligrams per square centimeter here in LA County. The areas most likely to have lead-based paint are gonna be windows and doors. That was actually pretty high reading. And you want to be careful because those are friction surfaces. So they're rubbing together all the time. They're doing a lot of work that's causing paint chips to come down or lead dust to be created. So that's the x-ray fluoroscopy. You can see, and if you were paying attention, you probably heard there that the action level that this, the Los Angeles County has is less than what uh, the federal regulation is. And so... Uh, federal regulation is, uh, was it one, 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 one microgram per deciliter? And the city of uh, Los Angeles County is, I believe, was 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 uh, micrograms per deciliter. So different. So paint chip collection. So this is, remember, if you say this is what we would do, but we wouldn't do, we would just simply do a, a paint chip sample. Uh, we would do a visual assessment for lead-based paint where we would go around and just assess the paint, uh, determine if there is a de minimis level of deteriorated paint, report on that, and also do a little a sample collection where we would grab a sample here, sample here, send them off to the lab just to get a couple quick uh, samples just to show, yes, there is lead-based paint here, and this is what the, um, you know, the actual weight is by percentage, just to give you an indication of whether or not it's just there. Uh, EPA says, we don't really want you doing that anymore. We want you to follow the protocol we've laid out. And so if you are going to do any paint chip collection, this is what they want. Number, for number one is very intrusive. They want all paint layers removed from all testing surfaces. Um, so, and they want samples taken from all surfaces in all inhabitable rooms. So we have base trim over here and door trim and the door and window frame, door window sill. You know, and then like, for instance, the window is different. The window sill is one piece. The window casing is another piece. The window trough is another section. And they want that, and, and that one, I have one window here and another window here. Right there are six samples. Then I have base trim. I have door casing. I have the door, multiple doors. All those things need to be tested. It is extremely labor intensive, extremely expensive because we've got to send all those samples out to the lab. And if I'm paying like $10 a sample, you can imagine that starts to add up really, really quickly. So, uh, you know, it's extremely expensive. It's very destructive, very labor intensive. And so this methodology really isn't used at all to obtain a lead free or lead safe certification. Um, the, what we do, and, is the, and this is what we're trained to do, we do in house, this is what we do for real estate transactions. This is what we do, if you remember, for the Philly, the lead safe law that they have, the lead, the lead certification law for all landlords. This is basically what is being done. And this is the, the dust sample collection and testing. And this requires, number one, you have to have a specially trained EPA dust sampling technician. This can also be done by a certified lead inspector or risk assessor, uh, but they have to be certified by the EPA as um, you know, being fully trained and certified to do so. If no lead is found, the property can earn an EPA lead safe certification. This is what all of the landlords in Philadelphia are currently seeking right now. Uh, if you own property in the city of Philadelphia, you are on this list. If I pop this back up here and pull this up, you can see based on these zip codes, uh, the red zip code was first. The, the, the people that, you know, landlords that own property in this red zip code had to comply. They had, this is their time frame. It's too late. If you haven't, you are in you are in the state of non-compliance. If you are a landlord in Philadelphia and own property in any of those zip codes that are in those 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 red areas, uh, and you don't have your EPA lead safe certification, you are in a state of non-compliance, and you are going to pay a penalty for that. Um, starting as of April, just a few days ago, April first, and running through September of this year. You have until, and, and you're in this these gold areas, if you own rental property here, you must get this EPA lead safe, uh, the dust sampling collection and to get and, and pass the test. So that's, that's where we're at with that. That's why this is important.
The cool thing about this is that it's not intrusive. We don't have to damage any services. We're going to look at a video exactly how that's done here in just a minute. Uh, this also tends to be less expensive than the other testing measures because, you know, you don't need as much training and certification. There's no uh, equipment to buy or anything like that. We basically get our sampling kits from the lab. And all they are, as you'll see, it, they're just wipes that are, and there's a certain protocol. You have to stay clean. You can't cross contaminate. There's a process that we have to follow in order to do this. Uh, but it's... Um, uh, pretty straightforward. And then the samples are sent off to the lab for analysis. And the lab's just simply going to tell us based on all these different areas that we test, whether or not we did in fact pass the inspection. And so uh, let's watch this video on exactly how this particular test is performed. After watching this video, you won't be a licensed lead technician, but you will be able to do this easy test. Let's get started by unpacking the box. You'll also need to have tape and a pen handy. Lastly, right before you do the test, wash your hands. The first place you'll test is the kitchen floor. You can't see dust from lead paint, but just a tiny bit in your home can be harmful for children. In old homes, dust from lead paint settles on floors and windowsills the places where kids play and put their toys. That's why you'll test in three places where your child may spend a lot of time, starting in your kitchen. First, take the cardboard square and tape it to the floor. Put a glove on the hand you'll use to wipe the floor and open one of the wipes. Wipe inside the square going side to side. Then fold the wipe in half so the dirty sides touch each other. Wipe inside the square again, but this time, wipe top to bottom. Put the wipe in the tube labeled kitchen floor, put the cap back on, and set the tube aside. Take off your glove and throw it away. Now find a spot in another room where your child spends a lot of time and repeat these same steps, but put the wipe in the tube marked other floor. Now let's test a windowsill. Choose a windowsill your child can reach and make sure the window is closed. This is the part of the windowsill to test. Put on a glove and wipe the windowsill from one end to the other. Fold the wipe in half so the dirty sides are touching and wipe the windowsill again from one end to the other. Put the wipe in the tube labeled windowsill, put the cap on and throw away your glove. Now you need to measure the windowsill you just tested. Using the tape measure in your kit, put the end of the tape measure that says start at one end of the area you just wiped. This windowsill is 30 inches long. Measuring to the closest inch or half inch is fine. Write down how long your windowsill is on the form that came with your kit. Now you'll measure the width or from front to back. Put the end of the tape measure at the back of the windowsill where it meets the window. Stretch the tape measure towards you. This windowsill is four inches wide. Write down how wide your windowsill is on the form. Complete the rest of the form. Include your phone number and let us know if you own or rent your home. Sign the form and put it with all three tubes back in the box they came in. Put the prepaid shipping label on the box and mail it. If there is a lot of lead dust in your home, I'll call you and we'll talk about what to do. We know your kids keep you busy, but by doing the simple test, you're taking a big step toward protecting them from lead poisoning. So you can see that's pretty straightforward. It's not, it's not a difficult test to do. One of the things they said, now that was put out by the state of Maine. And the state of Maine says that, um, you know, it's required, uh, well, the state of Maine actually uh, put that out there so homeowners can do that themselves. You saw one of the little things that popped up there at the end. It says it takes about two weeks. When we do the testing, we actually overnight, we actually either drop the samples off at the lab. Uh, we use the local laboratory for this or we uh, overnight it directly to the lab so they have it the next day. Uh, usually it's like a two day turnaround. We're actually, uh, we actually order it as a 24 hour turnaround to get the results back. But the, the in, in reality, because number one of COVID and number two, because of what's going on in the city of Philadelphia, the labs are a little bit overwhelmed. So it usually does take a couple days to get the results back. But um, that's what we have there. So it's pretty straightforward. You know, it's a pretty serious thing. 
Uh, it's something that, um, you know, because of what we saw on the map, because of the, the impact that it has, the public health concern that it is, excuse me, we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So the government takes this very, very seriously. Yeah, you know, they've actually got the federal law concerning the home buyer's rights. This is where I can sit back and you guys can take the class here because you guys probably know more about this than I do. But the federal law requires that before being obligated to buy a house or commit to a contract uh, on a house built before 1978, buyers have to receive uh, certain information, making them aware that this is a house that was built before uh, the, the abolition of lead-based paint in residential applications. And so we just want to make them aware of this. They're supposed to get an EPA-approved information pamphlet on identifying and controlling lead-based paint hazards. Uh, it's called Protect Your, Fa your Family from Lead in Your Home. It's a PDF that has to be given to a potential uh, buyer. Someone's entered into a contract. Any known information concerning the presence, so this is on the disclosure statement, if the homeowner knows, the seller knows anything about lead-based paint or lead-based hazards in the home, they're required to disclose that. Now, the reality is we know that most people have no awareness of that at all, um, but it's still there and they still have to disclose that if they are. Also an attachment to the contract or language has to be inserted into the contract that states uh, that includes the lead warning statement and confirms that a seller has complied with all of the notification requirements. Just check boxes that the federal government wants the sellers to, uh, to, to comply with. Uh, and so that we're making sure that the buyer is being made aware that they are purchasing a home. I know when I bought uh, my home, I didn't have to do that because why? My home was built in 1979, so I didn't have to go through that. But if you're buying a home built before 1978, you will get this information. So uh, you also have that 10 day, and this is federally mandated, a 10 day you know, a period, your contingency period, uh, your inspection period, whatever you want to refer this to, refer this as, refer to this as, uh, and it's the time when the buyer can do their due diligence to do a paint inspection, their risk assessment, they can make any determinations they want, hire the specialist to come in and do what they want to have done to, to, to formulate their opinion on the property. So uh, that's what they have to do. And these, these are all required by the federal government in order to be able to move forward with a transaction. So as we bring this in for a landing and as we wind this down, let's review some of the things that clients may ask you. They may say, you know, have questions for you. Um, actually, I think what we're going to see is, like I said, intuitively, I thought because the paint was being encapsulated, that this thing would just fade out into the rear view mirror. But I think what we're going to see is kind of a resurgence in focus on this as there's an awareness as more and more people become in the RRP program, more people become aware that the EPA is actually truly concerned about this. I think you're going to see a heightened awareness moving forward and you're going to have more and more questions about this uh, with regards to a real estate transaction. So uh, these FAQs are really just here to kind of help you out to prepare you uh, for some of the questions that you might get as an agent, you know, showing somebody a home. So what is lead? Or I could also say, what is lead, right? The English language is very, very uh, complex. I, um, we're actually doing a software project and the, the team that I'm using is actually in the Ukraine. And they um, tell me all the time how difficult it is to learn English. What is lead? We're talking about lead. We're talking about the toxic metal that's actually uh, you know, excavated from the ground. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a metal that's harvested, mined right from the ground. It's, used, it's been used for many years in all different types of products, and it still is. Uh, products that can be used in and around our home. So, so you know, if, if you're aware, you know, some people don't like some of the things coming over from China because they're concerned that they may, can, might contain higher concentrations of lead uh, because uh, China doesn't have the same regulations that we have with regard to the use of lead in these particular products and in paints used on these products. It's a, it's the, it's a material, it's, a, it's one of the elements on the periodic chart of elements. If you harken back to your days when you were in school and think about your, your chemistry class and that big chart up there with all the elements like, like uh, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, gold, silver, lead, it was on there, right? Um, so it's uh, just a naturally occurring element that's in the ground, but it is, has been found to be toxic to humans. 
uh, particularly when we get uh, our, get uh, get exposed to it in high concentrations, it can be problematic. So, where is lead found? We're talking about around homes. Well, think about that list, that matrix of all the homes uh, throughout the country. We said roughly somewhere between maybe 35 million and 50 million homes actually have lead-based paint in them, which can potentially lead to lead-based paint hazards, lead contaminated dust, the things that we're primarily concerned about today. And so uh, it's found in all of those homes. So any home built before 1978 may potentially have lead-based paint in it. In general, the older your home is, the more likely that there is lead-based paint in it. So, um, you know, somebody, let's see, who was it that said that? Uh, Regina said, hey, I saw a lot of older homes, historic homes, homes built in the 19th century in the 1800s. Yeah, you know, you want to you want to be more focused on this for sure. And remember what I talked about, about that user experience and how about that, that user experience needs to, the frame of reference for that does extend to the point when the people, our clients are living in their home, hopefully happily and safe and healthy. Uh, that's what we want. We want to see people move into healthy homes. And so the only way to do that is to have an awareness that knowledge is power. Remember, uh, you know, we need to know what we have. Not saying that, you know, we're, again, we're not trying to scare anybody. I don't want anybody to be scared. We know there's a path forward here. You know, we know that if we have an older home, that we're just going to have to have a more uh, a heightened focus on maintaining a clean, dust-free home. That's all. We're not talking about rocket science here. We're not trying to alarm anybody here, not trying to frighten anybody, not trying to dissuade people from buying old homes. Old homes are fantastic homes. Um, you know, that's not what we're trying to do at all. We're just trying to make, make people aware of what they need to do to properly maintain their home and live there in a healthy way. Another question you might get is, I thought the lead-based paint had been phased out. How many homes still contain lead-based paint? This is, this is kind of what I've been talking about all day. You know, roughly 40% of the housing units in the United States are thought to potentially have lead-based paint in them. That's a pretty significant number. Like I said, you're going to get different numbers here, you know, because of the movement through time and, you know, uh, but roughly 35 to 50 million homes in the United States. That's a big number of the homes. Sue is saying, my seller had a paint sample tested twice and it came back inconclusive both times. I believe he gave it to the lab. What do you think of those results? Should he be worried? Well, if it's inconclusive, I would say that, Sue, um, it was probably a poor sample that was taken. So what they do is they it's, it's a, a flame analyzation test. So they take the sample and they basically just burn it up in a crucible. And then they look at what's left. The, the, the lead actually will not dissipate and, and burn off. Um, and so they actually measure the amount of lead there. So if it was inconclusive, it just simply meant that the sample really wasn't good enough to be able to, to, to arrive at a conclusive uh, outcome. And so uh, I would say that maybe the sample wasn't big enough. Again, where we are today, you know, the, 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 where, the way the science is today, we really don't like taking just a singular sample uh, from here or there. We really do prefer, the better way to test to is to do a, an EPA lead safe you know, test, just to base, basically come in and see exactly, um, you know, if there is uh, lead-based paint in the house, the question isn't, is there lead-based paint? If there is, yes, it should be clean, it should be encapsulated, it shouldn't be exposed. So there should be no deteriorated paint, all paint should be encapsulated, that's number one. But then number two, once we've done that, we just want to make sure that we are keeping the dust in the house at a minimum and that we are able to maintain levels of dust in the house that are low enough so that there is not a lead uh, contaminated dust hazard in a, in a condition like we've read earlier, a condition in which there's a lead ha hazard that exists. So that's the, the better way to go about it. Yes, you can do another sample, but again, you're just doing a little grab sample from here, grab sample from here. That is not anywhere near an indication of what the overall condition of the lead is in the house. So um, the better way to go about it is to, to, to do the, uh, the dust sampling. Because the, remember, you're getting that dust sampling in multiple rooms throughout the house. That's a much better way to get a more comprehensive picture in terms of what's going on then in that house uh, with relation to the hazard that may or may not exist. 
Uh, just doing a little grab sample of the paint here and here isn't really going to get you there. So you want to do a visual inspection of the paint itself, make sure there's no deteriorated paint, and then do a dust sampling, and that's going to give you a better, unless you're trying to achieve something else, the, a lead-free certification, something like that. So uh, getting back to the FAQs, <clears throat> and thank you for the questions. Absolutely, guys. Great, great questions. You know, the uh, HUD basically estimates that there's roughly 38 million homes. So like I said, we're getting numbers between 35 and 50 million uh, of lead uh, you know, homes in the United States that contain lead-based paint. And so um, that's, the, that's the numbers. That's where we are. And so that's a big number. So, you know, the question was, I thought it had been phased out. So did I. <laughs> so did I. So why are we still talking about this? Well, it's the lead-contaminated dust. And that's the big deal. Uh, the, the, the dust is really where we want your focus. We don't want your focus anymore on the paint. Yes, we don't want to have deteriorated paint, but the big question is what's going on with that dust? All those kids that came up, you know, when we, when we pop up this map here, this isn't lead contempt, you know, this isn't deteriorated paint. These are kids that are exposed and have these high concentrations because of their exposure to lead contaminated dust. That's, that's the concern today. That's where we are. Uh, it's changed. So we need to be aware of that change. We need to be aware of why it's changed. And this is what we've talked about today. And so we want to be aware of what we need to do moving forward. And that is really to focus on the dust within the home. So what should I do if I'm concerned about my family's exposure? Well, you can test the house. But if you're really concerned about an individual, maybe they're presenting with symptoms, get that blood lead level test done. The blood test is the only way to find out if you or your family member already has lead poisoning. Remember, it, it, very, very difficult for doctors to figure this out. If you know somebody that's maybe they have symptoms of you know, lead contamination, maybe they've got flu-like symptoms, maybe it's reoccurring, maybe it's chronic, maybe it's you know something that's just everybody's scratching their head going, what in the world's going on here? Suggest that blood test. It's so simple to do. It's inexpensive, but uh, that's how people find out that they are exposed. That's, there's no other way to find out that you've been exposed without getting that test. So what is the most significant source of childhood lead exposure in a residence? Remember, when I grew up, the, they had the, the public service announcements, the, the, the okay, commercials on TV with kids eating paint chips. That's not it anymore, guys. Most of that paint is in good shape. The, the literature suggests across the board, there's, there's consensus among the scientific community that it is lead contaminated paint dust that is the most significant source of childhood lead exposure. And don't kid yourself thinking that there aren't that many kids that are being exposed. Look at this map and know that they are. Uh, this is no joke. This is why we take this serious. So uh, last question, how can I tell if my home contains lead contaminated paint, lead, lead based paint? Well, first off, you want to make the assumption that if it was built before 1978, that it does. Don't don't go by that, 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 that metric saying that between 1960 and 1978, only a quarter of the homes actually had lead based paint if your house falls in that time frame. Assume that your paint, that your house does contain lead based paint. And then Take those precautions. And then how do you tell? You, you go to you do the test and get, get, a, get an EPA lead safe dust sampling done so that you can actually know exactly what you have going on. So guys, that's it. We are at the end of the class. So if you have any other questions about what we've talked about today, or if you have questions about anything else, I'd be free to field questions on anything that we talk about and teach and, and anything having to do with the real estate transaction. But uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, Gail, you have a question? Gail, go ahead. Um, uh, you can speak. I've enabled you to speak. You just uh, got to unmute yourself, Gail. So feel free to ask your question. So just the, how do you prevent or how do you, other than just keep cleaning? Because if the paint was, there might have been lead paint behind it, but we've painted over it over the years. Our house is in 1900. It was built. Yes. So you just have to keep cleaning. There's no other way of redeeming it or getting rid of it. Is that right? There, there really isn't because it's it's been encapsulated. And, and the issue here is that the, the houses are moving all the time. I, I say it in a lot of my classes. We're hurtling through space at 67,000 miles an hour. There's seismic activity. 
Um, there's, you know, constant movement, you know, traffic going by causes movement. So the houses are moving, they're vibrating. There's, there's that movement there. So the, the, there's, there's the, just a breakdown of the, uh, of the materials there. Vibration, doors opening and closing, windows up and down. Uh, these vibrations cause the dust to develop and there's nothing we can really do to stop it. The critical thing is um, just to, and that's what the EPA lead safe, you know, dust or sampling is about the lead safe test. It's really to, to show people what level of cleaning is necessary in order to maintain going forward, uh, you know, what, what it is that, um, you know, the, that we're, what we're trying to accomplish. And so if so what would you would this you hope, wipe down the, sorry. <laughs> I'm just saying, the, 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 the key point here is that it is achievable. It's not like, you know, your, your house is going to be so bad that it's never going to be achievable. The point is, it's absolutely achievable. Um, so that's the, that's the first, first thing I want to, want to emphasize is that. So yeah, wiping down walls and that type of thing and just keeping. Yeah, absolutely. It's not coming through the paint per se. It's just filtering from. Correct. It's actually. Age coming from like in between the intersection of the paint and the trim work, uh, the, the base trim and the base of the wall, uh, you know, the, coming around. So like if, if you want to like go around the corners of your casing around window frames and things like that, caulking and sealing, that's definitely going to help. So when you do paint and encapsulate, the more caulking and sealing you do where you're sealing up those intersections to prevent the, the, the dust from coming from either underneath the base trim or around the door or window casing, those kinds of things are definitely going to uh, the help and, and enhance uh, your ability to prevent that from happening. Yes. And if you had said about you put took the baseboard out, like we have a baseboard that's been painted over, but if we just rip that out, that maybe solves some of that problem. I mean, of course, we could do testing, but it could if there's actually lead-based paint behind it. Now it's possible that that base trim was original and the base trim was installed before anything was painted. And so the paint's just on the surface of it at the intersection between the trim and the, uh, um, okay. you know, the, the wall. And so it just depends. But okay. if, it's, if it's something where there's lead-based paint behind it and the movement, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your time. Oh, absolutely, Gail, yeah, it's my pleasure. So let's see, uh, Elmer, you said that I just answered your question. Very good. And Sam, Samuel, you have a question. You can go ahead and un unmute yourself, Sam. Samuel, you had a question? I see you're unmuted, Sam. So if you have any question, you go ahead and ask. So while Sam's trying to get his mic to work, guys, the last thing I want to tell you guys, feel free to keep asking questions. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. So if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, while Sam, uh, you can talk, Sam, if you have, have a question. I see you're unmuted. If you're having some trouble, maybe you want to type your question in. But guys, um, we're here. We're here as a resource for you guys. We've never, you know, we don't have to have done a deal with you in the past or ever do a deal with you in the future. Uh, we're available to, to be used by you guys as a resource to answer questions, to provide unbiased third party opinions on things. Uh, I get agents all the time call me up and say, hey, look, I've never used you guys. I took one of your classes. My client hired somebody else to do an inspection, and we have a little bit of a problem here. And I just like to get your opinion on what you think of this. Don't hesitate. I'm happy to to, to interject, give you my opinion on something, just an unbiased third party opinion. Um, you know, it's it's not about you know. I, we'd love it if you guys would put us on your list of vendors. Absolutely, we work very hard to. Uh, to make uh, our agents very happy, but that's not what this is about. I'm saying that you, we never have to do a deal together, and I'm happy to help you out in any way we can. So, if you guys feel free to pick us up on that. There you are, Sam. Same. Hey, hear me? Yep, there you go. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering. I have a very old house, and it's huge, and so I again, I you know, assume everything was lead painted at one pint. So everything's been repainted. Does that 
make it safe enough or you have to burn the paint off all the way to the to the base no so that's that's what we're saying you know um uh, abatement is generally not opted for and so epa is certainly not recommending that you do uh, a lead-based paint abatement where you remove all the lead-based paint what they're saying is that uh, you should work towards achieving a condition in which the lead-based paint hazards are, at, are minimized to the point where they're not really a concern. Um, and, and that's done primarily through what we've been talking about, making sure there is no deteriorated paint, no chipping, de you know, peeling paint, flaking paint, chipping paint. All the paint is in really good condition. Just like I was telling Gail, you also want to make sure you're caulking all of the intersections around your trim to the wall, Anywhere where there's you know, dissimilar materials and it can be caulked and sealed, that'll help minimize the amount of dust that can come into the living space. Uh, doing all of those things, just keeping the paint very, very well maintained. And then also on top of that, doing a great job of minimizing dust in the living space. You know, keep frequently, you know, uh, you know, dust mopping the floors, whatever it's necessary. If you have carpet, keep, you know, carpeting, making sure that uh, it, particularly areas that are covered over with furniture and stuff get get moved and cleaned routinely. That kind of protocol, and you're gonna you're gonna have a, a space that uh, can absolutely be maintained well and 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 maintain what we would call a lead free condition. Okay, thank you. Absolutely, Linda, you have a question. Linda, go ahead and ask your question. Linda, you just got to unmute yourself. I've enabled you to speak, Linda. You just got to unmute yourself and you can ask okay, your just, question. Did I unmute? There you are. You're good. Oh, yeah. good. Okay. I just, I asked a very long question. I'll start again. <laughs> I just wondered if um, you could address what is the cost of the inspection, say that a seller wants to have it tested before they list the property or if a buyer is interested in the testing, because many times my clients just, um, acknowledge the lead-based paint disclosure and nobody ends up doing anything but i wouldn't even know how to direct them cost-wise with inspections can you talk sure. about that for a minute yeah sure so with a with a home inspection if you're doing it with a home inspection and this is for uh compliance with the epa protocol this isn't for that this is where we're testing four rooms and doing two samples in each room there's basically eight samples plus a quality assurance sample. So there's basically nine samples that we send off to the lab. The cost on that with a home inspection is $259. Um, and that is with, uh, like I said, those eight samples, four rooms, eight samples, and the quality assurance sample. If somebody wants additional samples or if additional samples are required, say for the landlord and Philly, it's an additional $30 per sample. Okay. Um, that definitely gives you a ballpark. So it's really not that expensive. It's not an expensive inspection to do uh, to, you know, to, to get the answers the clients are looking for. And I'm not 100% sure, but I think that there might be some discount. I'm not sure if that's rolled into uh, our bundle. So it might be even more discounted if it's part of a bundle. But um, okay. yep. All right. Thank it you. Gives Thank you a ballpark you. there. Thank you. Absolutely. Anybody else have any questions? I thought I saw Gail. Gail, I thought I saw your hand come up there. Gail, did you have a question? I keep seeing you pop up there. It looks like you have a question. Get on mute yourself and ask your question. Yes, I had one more question. When dusting and things like that rag that you use, should you be getting rid of it or can you wash it or, or like your mop? Like if you are picking up particles, is that being recirculated in the air? If you're well, if you're wet mopping, no, because that's you know you're going to collect it all there, and the idea is that you're rinsing that out. Uh, but that's that's actually a really good question. I mean, you you the, the idea is that whatever you're using uh, either has a negative charge to it, like some of the the cleaning, you know, the dust mops and stuff that are used. Um, a wet mop or a damp mop is definitely preferable so that you can actually collect it. Yeah, we definitely don't want to just be pushing the dust around. Uh, definitely want to, uh, you know, using a mopping 
Uh, if we have, for instance, hardwood floors or laminate floors or some type of vinyl floor, we don't want to be pushing the dust around. We actually want to be collecting the dust so that we can actually dispose of it. Um, but that's, that's a really good point. Um, I would actually defer you to the EPA and uh, we'll send this out with this course. I'm going to ask Patty to, to send this out. We're actually going to send out uh, one of the documents is, you know, basically what's required to prep for um, uh, one of our inspections, in addition to what the EPA says uh, the best practices are with regards to, you know, doing a cleanup and maintaining a clean home. All right. So there was another question here. Somebody asked, could you provide the web address that directs me to the Philadelphia lead base? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I want to put this up here, but I'm also going to copy and paste this and put this into uh, into the chat box. And so there it is there in the chat box. If you guys want to copy that, I'm also going to ask Patty to send that link out uh, when we send out the uh, the documents for the class as well. So you'll have that as a, as a resource as well. So, so let's see. I don't see any other questions. I hope I didn't miss anybody. Let me know if I did. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, if nobody else has any questions, I want to ask Patty to pop back on here and she's going to tell you guys how you're going to get your CE credits. And uh, she's going to tell you how you're going to get uh, about upcoming classes that we have. And uh, and we're still here if you have any other questions. So Patty, you want to come back on and help land this plane? Absolutely, guys. It's been a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who joined us today. We, we appreciate you being here. I, it's, it's such an important topic. It really, really is. And as you can tell by that map, it's, it's just, it just needs to continuously be taught, learned, and addressed. Um, Okay, so fun things. We do have some fun courses coming up later this week. We have Radon, which is three credits for Pennsylvania agents on the 21st, which is Wednesday at 9 a.m. And that's uh, three credits, so it's three hours. So it'll be nine to 12. And then in the afternoon, we have, no, Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m., avoiding the aggravations of home inspections. It hates that title because home inspections are not aggravating. They're not, they're fun, they're fun. So whenever I talk to a client the day of, I always tell them happy inspection day. So, because it, it's, a, it's a day of really getting to know your new home where you're about to make a million happy memories and you get to learn it inside and out and our inspectors take the time and do that with you. Um, let me see, we see some stuff coming up. Great. As far as the credits for today's course, you're going to receive that email from me. That email is going to contain the additional information that Pete just mentioned, uh, the, 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 the link to this website, a copy of this map, um, uh, a document letting you know what's required to, to prep, uh, as well as the other. Um, I'm also, that email is also going to contain my contact information. So hold on to that email. I'm also going to send you a copy of this presentation, but in a PowerPoint version. Um, but it's also going to have my contact information. Hold on to it. Because if you do not receive your certificate within 48 hours, let me know and I'll get it over to you. Easy peasy. Um, yes, yes. Yes, William. William's asking if this was a, if this course is approved in New Jersey. And yes, this course is approved in New Jersey. And for anybody on here, if you have dual licensing, but you only registered with just Pennsylvania or just New Jersey, shoot me an email right away and send me the other license because you will receive credits for both states. I, I can submit to both states for the credit. Um, other than that, everybody have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you again for joining us. And as I always say, please, everybody stay safe and stay well. Take care and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.